James famously wrote, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. And is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Because the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We're back in Matthew tonight and we enter into a section in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking about things like prayer. Things that involve spiritual discipline. And so we go to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 verse 1 where he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is a very interesting section in the Sermon on the Mount, because in chapter 5, which we previously studied, Jesus taught us the what of the Christian life. He gave those seven great basic commands of what to do as you're starting out your Christian walk and following Jesus. But now in chapter 6, we're, we're learning the how. If chapter 5 taught us what, now chapter 6 is teaching us how to do those things. And so this, this section has to do with what, what commonly is called spiritual discipline. It's a discussion of disciplining ourselves so that we deepen in our walk with Jesus. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, the, the apostle Peter wrote that we should strive to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so there are a couple of different ways to think about spiritual disciplines. On the one hand, there is what we might call practices of cessation. That is, there are things that we normally do in our lives that we stop doing in order to instead focus on our faith in Jesus. And then on the other end of that spectrum, there are some disciplines or practices that we engage in uh, with greater zeal, with, with greater desire. And, and those are uh, what we would call spiritual disciplines, these practices, practices of engagement. And so when we think about practices of cessation, things that we stop doing, there may be times when we engage in periods of solitude, where we go off by ourselves as Jesus did when he prayed in order to close off the world. Normally we're in the world, and maybe this is a, something where we take a period of time and we, we, we kind of get off by ourselves. Uh, there may be times when we engage in silence, where we meditate on God and the things of God in his word. There may be, and this is probably one of the best known ways of practicing some, a spiritual discipline that we cease, uh, but, but it's fasting. You know, we, we may cease for a short time uh, to eat as we normally would in order to allow that hunger to remind us of our need for God. On and on we could go. There are various things that we could think about, where the, whether it's being frugal with our money so that we can be uh, more diligent in our giving. Lots of ways to think about practices of cessation. On the other end of that, there are things that we ought to do when we engage in spiritual disciplines that we ought to engage in more so that we engage in more Bible study, deeper Bible study. We engage in worship uh, more often and more uh, fervently. Uh, we engage in prayer. We, maybe we set up times for us to be able to pray more diligently. Uh, maybe we just make up our mind we're going to engage in, in greater and deeper fellowship. There's so many ways that we could think about engaging in the Christian life more fervently. But what Jesus really wants us to remember, especially in chapter 6, is as we think about all these things that we could be doing to hone in and focus on God. He wants us to be doing God's will, but he wants us to do it with the right heart. And so uh, the ironic thing is that Jesus says there are so many people in his day, and is our day really any different, where people are doing things that are righteous in appearance, but Jesus says they're actually unrighteous because they are doing these things partially and maybe primarily to be seen. Uh, 
In J.D. Salinger's classic work, The Catcher in the Rye, the character Holden Caulfield says, if you do something good, then after a while, if you don't watch it, you start showing off. And then you're not as good as anymore. And I think there's a message there about the same in what Jesus is saying. There are things that we can do that initially they start out good. But over time we do them and we know that we're good. And so we want people to see us. And Jesus says that that will actually lead to unrighteousness. And so what Jesus decides to do in this section of Scripture is he wants to highlight bad practices and good practices, the good way to engage in spiritual disciplines and the bad way to engage in spiritual disciplines. And so what he's going to do is he's going to do a series of things where he says, when you do such and such, do not do it this way. And when you do this thing, practice it in this way. He's going to give us a positive instruction and a way not to do it. And the three things really here in chapter 6 that he highlights are charity, that is giving, praying, and fasting. And when he talks about each of them, he will say that there's a good way to be rewarded for giving and for praying and for fasting. You do those things in secret. And he says those who are the secretly righteous people who practice these things in secret, not to be seen by anybody else other than the Heavenly Father, they will receive an exciting reward because the Heavenly Father sees all things done in secret. But on the other hand, the people who do these things so that they are ostentatious with them, they're flashy in their righteousness, they have Jesus as all the reward they're going to get. But what we're going to do uh, in, in the time, short time we have remaining right now and then on into the next few weeks is I want to hone in on one of the spiritual disciplines which Jesus highlights, and that's the practice of prayer. Jesus himself seems to highlight it. But what I want us to do before we dive right immediately into the teaching by Jesus is I want us to do a little background work on prayer uh, in Jesus' time. And so as we look at uh, chapter 6, verse 5, the first four words in most translations say, and when you pray. So what I'd like for us to do in the next couple of weeks is I want us to think about what was prayer like in Jewish practice at the time of Jesus. In other words, if you were a faithful Jew and you prayed to Yahweh, the one true God, what was, what was the average person's prayer life like? And then I want to follow that up with a study where we think about what then also was the prayer life of Jesus like? And we'll take some time with each of those. So let's start out a little bit tonight thinking just for a few minutes about the prayer life of the average follower of the law back in the time of Jesus. If you look in Scripture itself, you'll look at a passage like Psalm 55, 17, where it says, David writing, Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. First of all, um, I find this verse to be interesting because I think I've prayed a prayer like this, and I know most of you have as well, where your prayer seems like David just to be evening and morning and moon, all, at noon. All I'm doing is uttering complaints and moaning and groaning in my prayers. I think we've all been there probably. But what's interesting about this verse is that it indicates a Jewish rhythm of prayer that most of them practiced. Uh, and, and it had to do with, uh, you know, set times in which they prayed. They prayed at 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 p.m. And they did this every day. And it was, uh, you know, like clockwork for most of them in, in their practice of prayer. This wasn't all that they did in prayer. But it's one thing we want to highlight right now. In fact, it's the reason Daniel was able to be caught praying to God rather uh, than, you know, obeying what had been told to him by the governing powers. So Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 says, Daniel continued to go to his house, which had windows in its upper room, open toward Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees three times a day. Remember, morning, noon, and evening. Three times a day uh, to pray to his God and praise him just as he had done previously. And so I want us just to think for a moment about the Jewish practice of prayer, which was to pray three times a day. You know, there's, there's something for us to consider here as we close about that. 
Because I think for a lot of us, we pray maybe at mealtime, maybe when we're really stressed out about a particular event in our lives. But I think there's some value to us thinking about setting for ourselves times during the day in which we set it apart as a sacred moment for us to reach out and to speak to God from the heart. Uh, I think you can overdo that. <laughs> you maybe can overschedule yourself in prayer um, and just becoming, you know, just slavishly going on and on about uh, your schedule of prayer, and you maybe lose heart in that. And that's something we don't want to do because Jesus has explicitly warned against it. On the other hand, are you living a prayer life now that you could honestly look at and say, you know, I'm praying to God in a way that I'm satisfied with, in a way that I should be? Maybe it's the case that you need to get out your phone and you need to set yourself an alarm once, twice, maybe even three times a day throughout the day to remind yourself to get up, go to a quiet place, and pray a short but meaningful prayer to God. And so in the words of Acts 2, 41 and 42, continue then steadfastly in your prayers. Jesus' name, His love is burning in our hearts like living flame.